my night of splendor. The foyer was a buzz. Everywhere was the many-colored sheen of satiny hair or silken garment, the flash of a ring racing through the air on an elegantly manicured hand as it caught the light from the groaning chandeliers, the brilliance of a bracelet as it winked and twinkled on an alabaster arm, the blacker than black and whiter than white of the gentleman's clothes. This was the first-class foyer of the theater. And so, not for me, the popcorn, crisps, aerated drinks and beers that were peddled to the hoi polloi. I sold only the most superior bonbons, individually wrapped in silver, gold and purple foils and ice-cold champagne in crystal flutes. Overpriced? Of course. But the golden boys and girls don't like regular priced stuff. They mistrust it. Suddenly, the roiling sea of the glitterati parted as before Moses' staff to reveal a lady. She wore an unadorned black satin gown, white gloves going up beyond the elbow, austere pointy-toed shoes, dark hair piled up in a knot on her head with a dark red something stuck in it as adornment, not an emerald or a diamond in sight. Just the pearly limbs, the brilliant eyes and soft pink lips telling of an inner sweetness. She looked as though she had been poured from above into her shoes. Erect, fluid, jointless. She was led into the room by a... I don't know what to call it. I could hardly call it a dog. Yet undoubtedly, it was a dog. Long flaxen hair, the color of captured sunlight, falling down its blonde flanks as if it had just walked out of a hairdresser's salon. Incredibly long nose, poking out of that long haired face. The bearing of an aristocrat, born of a long line of aristocrats. Around its neck, was a red collar studded with diamante. Or perhaps diamonds. He was certainly the most diamond-worthy dog I'd ever seen. A red leash led from that collar into the white-gloved hands of the lady. They walked towards me. She smiled, and the heavens smiled. I could feel myself melting with sheer delight. Surrounded by all these fancy folk, she chose to spend her favor on me. Oh, I have no words for the running river of warmth in my veins. Young man, she said in a tone like honey and smoke. Young man, I can't take him into the theater with me. So would you be so kind as to look after him till the show is over? He'll be good if I ask him to. Now, will you do that for me? If she had asked me to run naked and barefoot over broken glass in the freezing cold to bring her the moon, I would have set off instantly without hesitation. Of course I would look after this dog for her. Though no word crossed my suddenly stupid lips, she had to know that I would do anything she asked. A gentle smile spread over her delicate face and my strong adolescent limbs turned to mush and had the counter not been there in front of me, I'd have collapsed in a puddle on the carpet. I hastily bumbled around my glass-fronted counter to accept the red leash. Our hands touched... And oh, I almost died of ecstasy right there and then. With just a tiny glance over her shoulder, at the dog, not at me, she glided straight into the theatre as the bell jangled and the doors opened up as if at her unspoken command. The crowd surged in after her and in a few minutes, the foyer was empty and silent. Only myself and the dog.
I invited him to enter my little space and he walked into it ahead of me in a most graciously obliging manner. I wondered if I should offer him some champagne. A dog like this must surely be used to it. But I decided against it. He sat down and then lay down and then put his head softly and tenderly down on his elegantly crossed paws. It was almost eight and the show would run straight through till 9.30. No 90 minutes ever seemed longer. Normally I would have gone off duty at this time. I knew my mum would be in a dither, but nothing would have persuaded me to abandon my post while there was the certainty of the lady returning. The cleaning crew came in and I told them how I'd been left in charge and requested Mrs. G to inform my mum. I knew she'd do it. The dog himself never moved or even looked at them. One of the girls tried to coochie him, as if he were just a regular animal, you know. But he wouldn't give her the time of day. He really was most grand. By the time they'd finished up and carted away all the debris and hauled away their mops and dishcloths and polished everything and put it back in its place and left the foyer, with Mrs. G promising to call my mum, It was 8.30. In a confidential tone, I reassured the dog that it was just another 60 minutes. Off and on, we heard muffled laughter through the doors and once even a scream. Suddenly and without warning, the dog started to whine. I was startled. Was one permitted to stroke him? How could one comfort him? I bent over and pleaded with him not to worry because soon now, in only 35 minutes, the lady would be back. I understood his anguish. Wasn't I awaiting her return just as eagerly? He settled down, but only for a few minutes. Then he restarted the morning and I had to find a better way to calm him down more decisively. I pulled my chair close to him and stroked his silken back steadily and gently. Deep inside, I felt the same yearning for the lady to return. It's just that I didn't give it voice as he did. He looked at me with his soft brown eyes and the salon hair all hanging prettily around his face. I looked at the clock. It was only 15 minutes to go. I informed him of that and I'm sure he understood for he resumed his former position. Head on paws, eyes on doors. Hardly had a few minutes passed that he sat up straight and alert. I tried to mutter something confidence giving and he jutted out that long chin of his and rested it on my knee. A loud sustained applause broke out behind the doors. Ha! The show was finally over. The minute hand crossed six and kept marching on and no sign of those double doors opening. The foyer was silent and motionless with only my hand moving rhythmically over the dog's head, stroking, stroking, stroking. After seemingly endless minutes, the doors drew apart. And the crowds poured out, laughing and chattering and streaming out into the night. The dog was up on all fours and waiting, motionless. No lady yet. We waited and watched. His tail started wagging rapidly, beating against my trousered leg. But no lady yet. I could feel him strain at the leash. He hadn't moved, but he was fully alert and ready. Still, I could not see her. And then, she stepped out of the doors and turned towards us. The dog gave a short, sharp, happy bark. I must have been beaming madly too, because I caught myself still smiling stupidly ages later. I hurried out of my cubby with the dog in front. I handed over the leash and she smiled upon me like a golden rain of unsullied delight. She removed her glove and shook my hand and thanked me for my kindness. She told me how grateful she was 
that she had enjoyed the show knowing he was safe with me and she bid me a good night and then they left shimmying through the exit while i stood there goofy and dumbfounded and tingling with exhilaration oh what a night of splendor i just stood there for ages carefully cradling the right hand that she had shaken in my left still entranced by the vision befuddled bemused and bewitched i ran home later in a delirium of delight i didn't want to but i had to wash my hands before dinner my mom made me <laughs> <laughs>